Good afternoon. My name is Jim Spaeth, and I'm with the U.S. Department of Energy, I'm past chair of the IEA Bioenergy TCP. So the format is going to be uh, five speakers with five minutes each max, and I'm going to be strict about the time. I'm going to stand up and tell them the time is up if, after five minutes, and then we'll do a round of questions, and we'll compress this panel just a little bit. So I'll introduce each speaker before they go, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, first, I assume he's online, Thomas Ekbom? Yes. Thomas, okay, great. Uh, Thomas is the program director for biofuels at CBO, the Swedish Bioenergy Association. So Thomas, you have five minutes, and uh, please go right ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, and uh, thank you uh, also, Klausia and the organization for having me uh, on this session to this uh, uh, workshop. So uh, thank you, everyone, for joining this session. Uh, let me um, share my presentation. Let's see if I can have it in presentation mode. Uh, this is viewable. Everything working fine? Yeah, it's good. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm working the Swedish Bionity Association uh, Program Director. I'm also coordinating a network which is called Udriv. Uh, there is about 160 people, 60 corporations, organizations, all active stakeholders in the biofuels industry. Um, this is my day job, and I also have another assistant, and that is um, I'm. Uh, are very, I'm very honored to lead the task group 39, Biofuels to Decarbonize Transport. And it's a collaboration between 16 member countries and the U.S. Greens Council as a limited sponsor. Uh, we work here uh, with the areas of technology and commercialization and policy market sustainability and implementation. And here are some of uh, these countries that are um, collaboration uh, in this uh, group. Uh, I'm uh, also honored to have Klausia Mendes-Sousa as a co-task leader uh, in this Task 39 group. Uh, this slide here shows an interesting picture of, on one hand to the left, the larger plants, the larger biofuel plants in uh, Sweden that are in operation, and to the right-hand side, the plants that are in development. And looking first to the left top, uh, we have a wood-based ethanol plant, uh, and uh, that is uh, based then on a pulp mill, uh, which have been in operation for more than 100 years. So the ethanol is a byproduct. Then we have a raw tal, uh, diesel plant, uh, where they refine the tal oil, the crude tal oil into raw diesel, and that is transported to Prim uh, oil refinery in Gothenburg, where they make the HVO. Then we have two uh, conventional plants, uh, that is uh, grain to ethanol in Norrköping. Uh, that is the only one that we have in Sweden. And then we have a fame fuel plant in Stenungsund. Um, then we also have another uh, fame fuel plant, a smaller one. Um, both the ethanol plants and the fame fuel plants uh, have potential to increase the production, uh, but the policies have not been favorable to expand. Uh, then in the uh, second uh, last uh, plant, it's a very interesting, it's the world's first, it's a biomethanol plant, also located in a pulp mill where methanol is a side product. Uh, that is now refined into fuel-grade methanol. Uh, it also can be used as a component for make MTBE as a component then in, in petrol. And last here, we have a pyrolysis-based plant uh, starting from sawdust and then going to pyrolysis liquids, which is a base to make uh, bio-nafta, bio-petrol, whatever you call it, uh, HVO products. And this started in December in 2021, and it's been in operation since. Uh, and the interesting picture here, looking at the uh, right-hand side, that now we are looking into more advanced uh, biofuel projects. Uh, the first one, the HVO, uh, then we have more HVO from Prem in Gothenburg next, uh, second next year, 2024, up to 1 million uh, cubic meters. And then we have 
uh, three uh, electrofuel projects, uh, starting with the Skyfuel H2 with the German Uniper. They have teamed up with Sassol for 100,000 tons SAF uh, 2024. They started a, a feed uh, study or a, a project engineering. Uh, and, and then to go on the operation 2024. Then another uh, product uh, by Liquid Wind. And that's not the only one uh, they have for biomethanol. They have a series of projects that they are looking at also all over Europe. And in this one, they combined uh, bio CO2 with hydrogen from electrolysis to biomethanol. Uh, the same thing with Project Air. Uh, but then starting from fossil uh, CO2, uh, then we have a SAA in our strand, uh, possibly for biofuels. And then we also have additional SAF project by Vattenfall, Shell, Lansatec uh, in Forsmark. Uh, Prim then, uh, the largest oil company uh, re refining capacity in Sweden, have an end goal of 5 million tons by 2030. Uh, looking then on uh, the renewable share uh, of um, in transport, Sweden. Uh, Thomas, are, you need uh, to finish up in a half minute, please. Yeah, Sorry. right. Yep, uh, and they are one of the leaders. Uh, but it has come to the price that we import most of our biofuels, some uh, eighty-five percent of the biofuels. So. Um, we have found that uh, development in biofuels and commercialization mainly depend not on technology or market or the feedstock, but on policies. So uh, there is a lesson here that you shouldn't uh, do greenwashing. You have seen greenwashing. Here is green spray, taint, spray painting. Thank you. So our studies have shown here that we have identified certain critical factors for financing as the most important part, and that you need stable long-term regulatory framework. It's a key for securing progress. And we have to work on harmonize clear long-term policies that allow improvement, and also advanced R&D and D on new biofuels technologies, production support in commercialization. Uh, and that is my uh, last uh, uh, proposal for the regulatory framework. Thank you, Thomas. And we'll go to questions after all the speakers. Appreciate it. So next, I'd like to introduce my colleague, longtime friend, uh, <laughs> Jack Sadler, who is a, a professor of forest products at the in biotechnology and bioenergy, and, and Dean Emeritus at the Faculty of Forestry at the University of British Columbia. Jack. Thanks, Jim. So uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Thomas and Glossia because I was lucky enough to be the task leader for Task 39 with my colleague Jim McMillan from NREL. So the work I'm going to talk about uh, is available on the Task 39 website, if you look at this. And it's great being here in Vienna. So if I look at uh, a beautiful city with a long history, I come from a beautiful city with a very short history. So, uh, and Vancouver, so the motto of Vancouver is by land and sea and air we prosper. So if you look at where Vancouver is, it's about 11 hours flight to here. It's about 11 hours flight to Asia. It's about 11 hours flight to South America, to Brazil. So we're right in the middle of uh, long distance transport. So what we did with Task 39 is we decided there was gonna be more and more electrification of land transport. So more Teslas, more Nissan Leafs, but it's gonna be very hard to decarbonize. And I like the term, it's, it's gonna be not fossil carbon, it's gonna be renewable carbon. So my next slide. Oh, missing in the middle. The, what I work is our funding, it comes from the British Columbia. So the BC is British Columbia, Sustainable Marine Aviation Rail and Trucking. So BC Smart, took us about three beers to come up with that acronym. So the, uh, so BC Smart is very much focused on the sector. I'm gonna talk about aviation in the three and a half minutes I've got left. Uh, but uh, if you look at North America, what's interesting coming back to Europe, Europe's he heavily electrified in terms of rail. North America, it's gonna be a long time before rail is electrified in North America. So if you look at it, aviation, for sure, marine, for sure. And uh, so if I look at my slides, these are the, the members of our group. Boeing's a very important member because it's about three hours drive south of Vancouver. Interesting comparing Boeing and Airbus because Boeing's spending a lot of time on SAF. 
I don't like the term sustainable because working in forestry, sustainable is very hard to, de to defend. What is sustainable? All depends on your time frame, a whole bunch of issues. Biojet is much easier to defend, so we work on Biojet as compared to SAF, because, uh, but Boeing likes SAF because Boeing is, is funding it a lot. But what we have here is a range of airlines, shipping companies, Port of Vancouver. So again, if you go on the BC Smart website, we've done some work as well as IA, we've done it for IRENA. The punchline in my two and a half minutes there's left is that uh, we lose, use a lot of jet fuel. So if you look at being able to replace it, it's gonna be really tough for us to hit the 2030 targets, really tough, and very hard to hit the 2050 targets. And it's gonna cost us more, so definitely be prepared to be more for flying because it's gonna cost you more. And policy is a big deal. So if you look at it, if I go through very quickly, that was the take home. So if you have that, there's a test later on, see if you got the take home. Uh, but if you look at the issue, here, just now, it's interesting, in North America, we call it renewable diesel. In Europe, you call it HVO. So renewable diesel is effectively diesel that comes from predominantly lipids. Just now, the policy, you can actually take jet fuel and run it in a truck. You can't take diesel fuel and run it in a plane. So if you look at just now, all the policies encourage using renewable diesel in trucks, not in planes, and also to make Jet fuel, you re need to add an additional step. You have to do an extra hydrogenation step. So why pay the extra money to make something that costs more expensive when policy is not pushing it that way? So Jim here had a meeting in Pittsburgh about two weeks ago, big focus on biojet, which some people call SAF. And uh, I think the US is taking the lead. In British Columbia, we have a low carbon fuel tax. We have a carbon tax. So BC is actually a good place to be where we are geographically. We have lots of biomass. We have a very active forest sector who's motivated to be sustainable. So if you look at our forests in BC, they're sustainable by a whole bunch of different criteria. Despite that, there's a big debate just now about the sustainability of biomass, which will never go away. So I think one of the criteria we have is to show that this is sustainably managed, that you actually have a resource that's sustainably managed. How much more time is that it? minute, well, I'll go back. So, so if I look at it just now, biojet fuel is going to be essential. I'm just talking about jet fuel, but if I had enough time, I'd talk about marine, trucking, and rail. As I said, rail is very much, if you look at even China and India, a lot of rail is still using diesel, if you look at using it around there. So electrification, and also in China, where's the electricity coming from? If it's coming from coal, how good a job is that actually doing? So also, if you look at Airbus, Airbus is spending a lot of time on hydrogen, which I think is great. But if you're traveling from Vancouver to Vienna with hydrogen, one third of that plane is full of hydrogen because hydrogen is not dense. You've got to compress it. And then if you want to be in a hydrogen-based plane, remember the Hindenburg as well. So if you want to go there in hydrogen, electric, British Columbia is a world reader in electric planes between Vancouver and Victoria is about half hour flight. So if you look at the size of battery you need to go from Vancouver to Victoria just now, it's as big as the plane. So if you look at flying via electricity, it'll be a long time before I'm going from Vancouver to Vienna in an electric plane. Thanks. Jack was one and a half seconds under time. He's gonna get the award and... Uh, do we have uh, Patrick? Clint Baum on the line? Yes. We do, Patrick, excellent. Patrick is Senior Researcher, Sustainable Mobility at Research Institutes of Sweden, RISE, and Chair of ETIP Bioenergy. Patrick, uh, take it away, thank you. Great, Jim, uh, and great to be here, everyone. Sorry I couldn't join you physically this time. Um, so we have a fantastic uh, rainy weather here in Sweden instead. Uh, okay. Um, I will uh, describe uh, the role of ET bioenergy and also give a view on what we're doing and then also on the topic how to accelerate uh, the development. Uh, and the role of the European Technology Innovation Platform for Bioenergy is to bring together the actors from academia, industries, civil society and, and others that are engaged in uh, the development of sustainable bioenergy and competitive biofuel technologies. Uh, the role is also to represent an unbiased, united and consolidated view of the biofuels and bioenergy industry in Europe. Um, and we act as uh, 
the main interlocutor for DDRTD to implement also the strategic energy technology plan in the field of biofuels and bioenergy for the full uh, TRL scale. Uh, we also contribute to the development of a cost competitive um, world-class bioenergy and biofuel value chains and also then to creating this healthy bioenergy industry in Europe. Um, we also contribute to accelerate the sustainable deployment of biofuels and bioenergy and we promote research, technology development and demonstration. Uh, a little focus uh, at the moment uh, is that we now have a new uh, secretariat since uh, June this year uh, with BEST, uh, so uh, Austrian partners here. Uh, so we're very happy to work with Dina and Monica from BEST uh, with this. Uh, we have also recently formed a task force on biogas uh, in order to, uh, let's say, answer the requirements and, and also contribute directly to the work with the Repower EU. And, and that, in that respect, our focus will be on new technologies that could help fulfill the targets uh, linked to biogas in the Repower EU. Uh, we are also doing an update of the SRIA, so the Strategic Research and Innovation Agenda. Um, and this is also an opportunity for those of you that would like to contribute uh, to, to put uh, in the context, what, what do we need to do? Uh, and this is bioenergy. We also include electrofuels and, and integration of hydrogen. Um, so the aim here is to identify research and innovation actions and activities that, that are needed, that are central to push the sector forward. So, so this is really a central document. And the aim is, of course, that the industry and all the stakeholders, they should feel that this is our document where we have our central requirements. Uh, then there's a lot of information, of course, as well on the ET Bioenergy web, web page. Uh, we also have many other activities, uh, either ongoing or planned like uh, innovation challenge uh, that we have done before in, in, in linked projects, uh, also to, to, to push innovation uh, and to find, uh, let's say, speeding up uh, the steps in the TRL ladder. Uh, and also then more and more interaction with society stakeholders, which has been mentioned today. We need to talk also with the actors outside, let's say the bioenergy fan base, uh, so to say. Uh, and then uh, what can we do to push things forward? Uh, I think we need to educate our decision makers on all levels, not just on the highest level. I think on, on municipality level, on national level, on everywhere. Uh, and we need to push for these science-based strategies where bioenergy is one part. Uh, so uh, I would go for more science and, and less feelings uh, and, and less guesses. Uh, and of course, uh, we need to overcome the policy barriers. The, this has been kind of a, uh, boring to say, oh, it's the policy, it's the policy, that's the barrier. The barrier. But, but it's, it's once again, uh, uh, uncertainty is, is creating, for example, now with the latest the primary biomass discussion. And also right now uh, in Sweden, as we speak, there is uh, uh, an interest to cut the reduction duty uh, they, if they could, they would cut it to zero, but now they want to, to, to back it off. And, and that sends really a lot of signals to industry, which is supposed to invest. Uh, so that's, that's really bad. Uh, we need stability uh, and, and the development needs the stable policy scheme, so to say, uh, has been said before. Uh, yeah, uh, and more exactly, we, we need to reach outside and interact with a wide range of stakeholders. And also recognize that we as a sector, as a bioenergy sector, is not perfect and no one is perfect. And uh, the bioenergy has and vi will continue to, to evolve and also adapt with to new, uh, the new situation and, and also evolve in, in terms of sustainability. Uh, and also we need to put uh, bioenergy in a system perspective. Uh, I think everyone agrees that cars will be electric but there is a huge fleet uh, which is out there today. So trucks, ships and aviation, they will need significant volumes uh, permanently of, of liquid fuels, biofuels. And also that the alternative here to uh, biofuels is fossil fuels. It's not something else. 
So I think also uh, it needs to be said that we should stop dreaming of solutions like hydrogen uh, in the short to medium term. I think hydrogen has a niche, of course, but it has strength and weaknesses. And, and I, I believe it finds a, a very clear space in hard to abate industry applications and so on. So I think we, we need to come to a more uh, realistic uh, scenario here. And, and there is signs of, of that growing in, in some spaces, but in, in other spaces, it's not so much. So yeah, that was my short uh, intervention in this panel to start with. Thank you. Patrick, thank you very much. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Fu Li Li. He's the head of the Molecular Microbiology Engineering Group at Qingdao Institute of Bioenergy and Bioprocess Technology. Do we? Excellent. Uh, professor, please go right ahead. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here and introduce our research and development in China on bioenergy. I come from Qingdao Institute of Bioenergy and Bioprocess Technology, which belongs to Chinese Academy of Science. Our institute have a main research uh, area on bioenergy. We have uh, teams working on energy plant and microalgae uh, breeding. Uh, from this uh, feedstocks, we have different group groups working on the uh, thermal and chemical com conversion or bioconversion to uh, biofuel, including gasoline, jet fuel, machine, bioethanol, and biodiesel. Uh, in the next three slides, I will talk uh, about some uh, development in China. For bioethanol, uh, in China, we we have a policy to use 10% ethanol in gasoline. Uh, but at this moment, we only produce uh, 200 ton to, uh, limited uh, ethanol from food. So we, have, we need uh, 10 million ton ethanol in the future. In China, uh, we have uh, um, uh, many uh, factories uh, produce steel, or we use some coal. So, for example, for the steel industry, we have uh, 90 billion uh, 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 steel, steel, steel thinkers. With this, uh, you know, some company like Lanza Tech, they developed uh, uh, some factory in China, produce uh, 40,000 ton per year ethanol in China, including Chao Fei Dian and Si Zhui San. It's two different plants. From biomass to ethanol, uh, it, uh, it uh, feel under development. Guotou Biotech and another private uh, company, they are developing two factories produce ethanol from agriculture uh, waste. For, uh, for the techno technical challenges, we still working on some uh, bioreactor improvement to uh, improve the transfer efficiency of uh, thin gas to bioethanol. Uh, we also working on some genetic uh, improvement of uh, uh, another plant. Also, we pay attention to legally derived value-added products to increase the value chain of the uh, full, full chain. For the biodiesel, we have some group one working on the uh, catalysis of uh, fat and uh, uh, oil to biodiesel. At this moment, we have a, a, a plant in Shandong province produce 1 million ton biodiesel per year. We also uh, have a, a license 
uh, in another province to produce 10, 100,000 ton biodiesel uh, uh, every year. But for this technology, we, we also have some challenges like the corrosivity of the feedstocks and the catalysis. Also, the feedstocks have some problems like uh, impurities. Also, we try to increase the catalyzed, uh, catalyzed life. Uh, in our institute, we still try to improve the catalyzed last last in for the for the uh, bioreactor for the third uh, research development uh, in china uh, we are developing the route from biomass to high quality jet fuels for example uh, sino petroleum the biggest uh, oil refining company in china they announced uh, a plant which can produce 1,000 uh, uh, ton uh, jet fuel per year uh, in Jiangsu province. Uh, we also try to produce uh, jet fuel from biomass, but uh, we uh, are still in a pilot uh, stage. The te technical challenges uh, uh, are raw material limitation uh, because it is difficult to collect uh, uh, the feedstocks. Also, we have some uh, problems like the composition deficiency, like uh, the oil molecules are most uh, uh, made chain hydrocarbons. Also, the maximum addition limitation. Uh, for example, only less than 50% can be added in jet fuel. In the future, uh, our institute working on some uh, biomass gasification and the synthesis to jet fuel. We have a pilot uh, um, facility, 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 facility in Qingdao. Uh, the, the size is 100 ton per year. The, the oil we, we get uh, can fit jet fuel standard. So it's our three main research uh, mission in China. Also, we have some uh, center working on extended energy big data. Professor, I need center. to ask you to uh, please okay. uh, finish up. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm finishing. This, this is a uh, uh, research uh, center uh, with dealing with different factors with energy uh, for policy uh, for decision making. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Our last speaker this morning is um, Sri Sunil Kumar. He's the Joint Secretary for Refineries and Exploration at the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas in New Delhi uh, of the Indian government. Uh, Sri Kumar, please go ahead. Thank you for being here. Uh, good evening and good afternoon, Jim. Uh, I would have loved to join in person, but due to some free engagement, I could not join this <coughs> August uh, panel. So esteemed panelists, all participants, namaste and good evening from India. I express my sincere thanks to Bioenergy IEA for inviting me today. Uh, I would uh, talk a little bit about our program uh, before that, uh, coming back to the main topic, how to accelerate uh, deployment of advanced biofuels. So recent uh, international development has brought back focus on biofuel. In India, we had continued our journey with biofuel taking small steps and our, our portfolio of biofuel included ethanol, renewable gas, biodiesel, and SAF. In fact, it's a, it's a new entrant. Uh, so energy security and environmental concerns were the two primary reasons for driving bio biofuel uh, program globally. But in India, we have added another dimension, which was very important because biofuel 
agricultural program has acted as a tool for rural development and enhancing farmer farmers income as well as local employment too that was a great force multiplier for us to move forward in this so at this stage when the energy systems are resetting and supply chains are being reconfigured worldwide uh, for fossil and conventional energy biofuel has become important component of this uh, reconfiguration it is important for our energy transition for developed and developing countries alike for developed countries it substitutes the existing energy for us like developing countries it adds an extra bit of energy which we need in future and we have need more energy so it's a kind of uh, supplementary for us and complementary for the developed economies we have a policy of national biofuel uh, which aims on all these dimensions and provides us, us with a policy framework uh, growth of uh, biofuel in the country and this biofuel provides a sustainable alternative to energy transition as liquid fossil fuel dominate the transportation sector replace this fuel with energy will sig significantly contribute to comprehensive energy and sustainability goals and we hope that we uh, as a country will also suffer add more energy through renewable energy sources uh, various policy programs are in uh, functional and our companies are taking a uh, lot of interest and their impressive achievement like e e10 like professor fully has mentioned that 10% ethanol is blended in petrol in china in india also 10% ethanol is blended and i am glad to announce that we have achieved complete 10% blending in the country way in advance 6 months in advance from the targeted date of december 22 so the ethanol program has shown a remarkable growth from 1.4% in 2014 to 10% in 2020 has been the growth in ethanol uh, from the conventional 1g sources another uh, biofuel which has shown remarkable growth is renewable gas we are preparing and making around 5000 uh, plants based on renewable gas which will make renewable gas from biomass and for this i will discuss later on what are the challenges we are facing in this so the main challenge is the raw material availability and aggregation the raw material is scattered and it is very very time dependent for the harvest mm -hmm. season lasts for around 45 days we have to aggregate store and store it properly so that it can be used throughout the year this is proving to be a major challenge for advanced biofuel both second generation ethanol as well as compressed biogas we have planned a uh, blockwise mapping of biomass production and we have also working in two or three states the federal governments in the country to participate three model of farmers aggregators and oil companies which are setting up these second second generation ethanol plants uh, this is the first uh, year in which one of our second generation ethanol plant was inaugurated on biofuel day by honorable prime minister of the country we are right now aggregating so we are testing this whatever model and this is a major major challenge second major challenge which uh, in advanced biofuel what we are uh, are facing is yield improvement because yield is poor and capex because of that opex is very very high the cost of electricity cost of enzymes and the yield from the biomass is poor so the cost of ethanol or renewable gas produced is high so we are planning so that and uh, working with our technology scientists research fellow that this yield should improve so that the opex comes down and we get uh, this advanced biofuel at a reasonable cost third important part which we are working on on the bioproduct the lignin is a major bioproduct which is like bio coal and valorization of this lignin is very important and very important to improve the cash flow for these plants so our scientists are working on uh, lignin rich residues to produce high value chemicals uh, in one of the plant which is coming up which will be uh, functional from next year which is based on bamboo uh, chips bamboo biomass in that we are also producing acetic acid and furfural which is earning more giving more cash flow than conventional 2g uh, 
second generation ethanol, which is the main product. So similarly, for all these, our 2G plants, we are working on 2G lignin residue, which can be uh, turned into biobitumen, levonic acid, lactic acid, aromatic like vanillin, bioplastics, and silica after purification. So if this works forward, our cash flow will improve and this 2G biorefineries will be feasible. So this, these are the some points which are we working on. And thank you for the opportunity. And these are the ways to accelerate the advanced biofield in the country, in my opinion. Thank you, everyone, for the question. Th thank you very much, Shri Kumar. OK, well, I really appreciate the speakers being so focused and uh, an excellent range of speakers. And we're going to first go to online questions to see if there are any. There are none at this time. We may have lost our, our online audience. Do we have any questions in this room, in this room? Yeah, please. Um, can we get him a microphone? Uh, my name is Greg Rohr, and uh, at the present time, I'm at the University of Applied Sciences here in Bergenland, Austria. And my question's for Dr. Sadler, who's here. Um, if I read your slide right, you said that we're going to need about 150 billion liters per year of biojet. What's your take on the potential of microalgae, or more specifically the energy-dense molecules derived from it, to make a dent in that demand? Yeah, so, uh, you know, good question. So I, I think we need all of the above. So the idea is we need everything, because we use a lot of fossil fuel. So I think uh, the US NREL, there's a lot of work going on with algae for quite some time. I think the challenge with, with algae is they make lots of lipid and they don't grow well. And when they grow well, they don't make lots of lipid. So if you look at it in terms of using algae as a, as a lipid feedstock, I think we, we, we want it, but it's still a ways away, despite a lot of good work that's been done in the US and Japan. So I think uh, what I think will happen just now is the lipid pathway is, the, is where 99% of the HVO and the biodiesel, renewable diesel, all comes from lipid feedstocks. So by 2030, the vast majority of those feedstocks will come from lipids, because the alcohol to jet, the gasification are all still evolving. But we need all of the technologies to work, because we, we use a lot of hydrocarbons. Thank you. Other questions in the audience? Yes, please. Um, Jack, can you? Uh, a question to uh, Mr. Sedler. Uh, you mentioned Hindenburg. Uh, is the the danger between hydrogen and uh, bio uh, uh, methane? Is it really the difference is so big? Also, methane can explode. Uh, what do you say about the danger of hydrogen compared with uh, methane? Thank you. I guess to, to answer your question, what I found interesting in the presentation just now, so Alberta just now is an is a oil-based economy. So Alberta uh, is an oil-based economy. So they're trying to transition away from oil to using natural gas. And they're going to go from natural gas to hydrogen because 99% of hydrogen comes from natural gas right now. So I found it interesting that they're trying to strip the hydrogen off the methane. And we heard about someone adding the hydrogen to the carbon to make the methane. So I found it interesting in terms of the presentation. So if you look at my own sense is the hydrogen economy will have to develop from natural gas first because we've got lots of natural gas, we know how to do it. And then you've got to look at the green, what's the benefit of having green hydrogen as compared to fossil hydrogen. And I also think making hydrogen is energy intensive. So if I've got electricity, uh, do I want to make hydrogen from that electricity or do I want to run my Tesla? with that electricity. So I think making hydrogen via electrolysis, we can do it technically, but it, it's expensive. Okay. Other questions? All right, I'll ask a question uh, first to Professor Lee. 
you talked about how your goals for ethanol are not being met, uh, but I'm wondering how you foresee uh, and what your goals are towards other applications of biofuels like heavy duty applications and SAF. If you could tell me how you envision China going in that direction and what your objectives are. Uh, yes, China uh, pay many uh, attention in renewable, renewable energy uh, recently. Uh, besides ethanol, uh, by zero, China uh, developed very much in the field of uh, uh, sun, um, turning sunlight to electricity. Like uh, Professor uh, said, in, in, Outside, uh, uh, we now can produce a uh, great amount uh, hydrogen from its sunlight derived electricity in the near future. With this great amount of uh, hydrogen, it is possible to fix more carbon dioxide in the near future. Uh, besides that, China also use coal to produce ethanol uh, by using some chemical routes. It's our uh, former director, Professor Liu. They developed uh, uh, at least two or three big, uh, big uh, factories produce ethanol from coal. Uh, but they're not allowed to, this ethanol produce are not allowed to add into uh, gasoline now. Uh, like uh, uh, the technology from Lanza Tech and uh, two, uh, two other company from Syngas by Asino, it's more, uh, it, 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 the government uh, uh, permit this technology to be used. Uh, but uh, for, for legal cellulose Asino, uh, China, um, still behind, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, the Germany or, or United States. <laughs> we, we, we hope we can have uh, uh, two or three new plants to be operated in the near future. Otherwise, we need uh, many, many more ethanol uh, in China. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, for Joint Secretary Kumar, could you give us uh, an update on, I know you're building, I believe it's up to 12 2G ethanol plants, the status of those plants and how you envision uh, those migrating and, and the 1G ethanol industry migrating to producing SAF in the near future? Well, this uh, five of uh, these 12 biorefineries are in advanced stages of uh, completion. One was completed in August, the commercial uh, commissioning testing is going on. The commercial production will start from December this year, for which we are aggregating biomass which to the challenge I pointed earlier. Uh, for SAF, we are having some demonstration plant. One demo plant will use conventional animal tango lipids, use cooking oil. Two other will use alcohol to jet root. One is uh, Lanja Jet, this was Lanja Techs, one of the subsidiary of they are, that technology will be using for um, alcohol to jet. And second, we'll be using another technology which a Brazilian company is <coughs> take, uh, bringing into India, that is also alcohol to jet. So these three demonstration plant, uh, uh, we are hoping that will complete by 25, 26, so that we can at least uh, blend 1% of our eight aviation turbine fuel through bio ATF or SAF, what you call there. That is our plan for right, uh, right now. And uh, this biomass is also going into uh, renewable gas also. We are planning to build or set up 5,000 compressed biogas, which is called in India, which is renewable gas worldwide uh, by 25, 26, so that we can at least produce 15 million metric ton of um, gas or renewable gas uh, for our consumption. And uh, biodiesel, uh, we don't have much feedstock, which is conventionally is made from palm steering, which is a byproduct of palm oil uh, 
which is produced as edible oil and palm steering. So biodiesel, conventional biodiesel, we have some shortcomings for feedstock, but our program is there. We are blending B5 and B7 wherever it's available in the country in the diesel. It's called 5% or 7% of uh, biodiesel in diesel. So these are our biofuel uh, program for the next uh, three to four years. You must have heard that we are introducing flex fuel vehicles in the country because we think that our ethanol production will exceed 20% requirement, which is 10 billion liters by 25, 26. We are hopeful that we'll be producing more than 10 billion liters a uh, year after 25, 26, so that it will go into uh, flex fuel four wheelers and flex fuel two wheelers. So that is the area of our development. We are more bullish on biofuel than EV because EV has some challenges and being a developing country, power requirement and also we feel that biofuel is a transition fuel for us in the country for the coming 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, um, Paul. You can come up. Uh, a question for our two Swedes. Um, Particularly around um, SAF, uh, you have some very aggressive targets for SAF deployment. Um, I think it's 100% by 2045 and 27% by 2030, something around that. Very aggressive, though. How are you going to achieve it? You want to start, Thomas? Okay. Uh, I, I haven't seen the latest... Uh political update on this one, so it might be changing. <laughs> yeah, uh, we are following Norway to having the second first reduction quota mandate on on uh, on air traffic uh, in the world. Uh, but we're starting quite uh, small. Uh, so the first uh, year we started with a half percent uh, by volume. Uh, so it means around 12,000 cubic meters. And our total consumption of uh, jet fuel is about uh, 12 terawatt hours or so 1.2 uh, terawatt hours. Uh, so the total volume uh, is not that very big. And looking at the plants that are in the development, we have 50,000 tons in one plant, 100,000 tons in another plant, uh, and possibly a, a third plant from SD1. Uh, there is actually more production in the development uh, coming five years than there is room for in the regulatory framework market. Uh, so I see that uh, it's now on voluntary basis uh, for the airlines and the airports to uh, purchase uh, these uh, volumes. Otherwise, it has to go on export. But your question is very much valid uh, in terms of uh, feedstock and technology uh, levels. Uh, and we don't have, we have not seen uh, uh, biomass in wood fuels to uh, SAF yet, but it will uh, probably uh, come on screen uh, within the next five years at, if the technology development goes forward. Yeah, Thank you. nothing more to add from my side. I think it's uh, yeah, good Thank answer you. from Thomas. Yeah. Klaus, yeah, please go ahead. Yes? Yes. Uh, a question for Thomas. Uh, Thomas, uh, you mentioned a large project with 60 plus corp corporations. Uh, so in line with the with this round table's main theme, which is what what is necessary for deployment, what are the scientific challenges that you hear coming from the industry? Uh, can you give us some uh, insights on what the industry needs from science. Yes, thank you very much. Um, our experience has shown when we uh, have dealt with uh, industry leaders uh, that they do have possibility to move the technology forward to the uh, highest levels uh, when you reach then the commercialization. Uh, financing these plants uh, the capital is available on the markets, uh, but the risks are too high uh, for them to go for investment decision. Uh, and that is depending on the policies that we have. And just today we had a voting for a new prime minister and the new government has declared to change the reduction quota mandate for the road transport uh, 
uh, virtually going then to be the leader in Europe and to be among uh, the uh, average of the countries. So there's very much a fast shift and change in the Swedish policy year by year, and that doesn't give us the certainty that we need, and especially for the investors. If, if I may comment that also, Jim? Yes, please, go ahead. Yeah. I, I believe that there is... Uh, I had a look at some old slides a couple of years ago and, and looking at the barriers and so on. It's, it's the same, uh, the, as, as Thomas said, it's the uncertainty of both having a market uncertainty and a technology uncertainty. And that creates too much uncertainty together. So that, that makes, and it's a lot of people that want to build the, the, the third or fourth plant. No one wants to build the first and may, maybe they want to build the second one. So and that is still, uh, but, but then, then I also think there, there is still uh, a gap between uh, research and, and industry and, and so on. And, and, and this value of, of death uh, and that, that the financing comes in and everything. So, so I, I think we're, we're stand still. And, and, and here we had a political decision as the example in Sweden with seven parties uh, just a couple of years ago that set out the framework until 2030. And then a new government comes and, and they just take it away. So, so um, it's, uh, we, it's really bad for uh, development and investments. Yes, I think we all agree heartily with that. We need stable policy, we need investment, we need technology improvements, and uh, we need our financiers to believe in all of the above, the technology and the policy security. So I'd like to ask you to please join me in thanking this excellent panel. Thank you so much. And in particular, thank you to uh, Professor Lee at a very late hour and uh, Sri Kumar for uh, your late evening. Okay, we're gonna move to the next panel. And I believe, um, oops. We're gonna take a short break, oh, uh, take a short 10 break. minutes.